Turn your Bibles to Psalm 32. As I said last week, this is our last week in the book of Psalms for a while. Uh, next, or next week, uh, Pastor Dave will be preaching in this service. And the week after, I'll be going back to 2 Thessalonians as we finish off that pair of books. As is our custom, we don't just do the first of those books. You know, 1 Thessalonians, 1 John, 1 Peter. They always get all the good time, but we always forget about the second ones and the third ones. So we'll be finishing up our study in Thessalonians uh, starting in two weeks. As we look at our text this morning, I want you to think about something that many of you probably know much more about than I do, and that is the GI Bill. Quick show of hands, the GI Bill, I wonder how many of you or a spouse or family member utilize the GI Bill in your time? Yeah, I was thinking there'd at least be a good amount in this service. Now again, to paint a, a simple, I know it's more complex than this, but the GI Bill is a benefit given to those who have served in the armed forces. And the benefits include things like ongoing education and for some, uh, housing help. And it's this idea of because of service or because of connection to the armed forces that there are then future benefits that I want to help us to use to understand the second part of Psalm 32. You are eligible for the GI Bill and all its benefits because of your service in the armed forces. Because of that commitment to serve in our nation's military, you are then able to later access certain benefits. And it's that idea that comes into Psalm 32. As we looked last week at the beginning, the beginning of Psalm 32 talks about forgiveness. A total, complete forgiveness from God. A reconciliation of sinful men to a holy God. And then verse 6, where we stopped last week, begins, therefore. And so the relationship that started because of repentance and forgiveness, that reconciled us to God, now becomes the basis for a completely different life in the future. That the forgiveness we have has benefits to it. The forgiveness we have in Christ changes our future. And so just as the GI Bill represents the benefits and the results of military service, so today with these final verses of Psalm 32, we see the results and the benefits of our forgiveness. Because we have been forgiven by God, the following things are true. Because of being reconciled to God through forgiveness, this is now the life we lead. So let's look at our text this morning. We're going to begin in verse 6 of Psalm 32. And each section of our psalm today presents two ideas, a pair. And usually they'll be in contrast. Here in the first one, they're together. But again, thinking of what are the benefits, what are the results of forgiveness that we have. And the first pair that we see in Psalm 32 is in verses 6 to 7, and we see prayer and safety. Follow along as I lead. Therefore, let everyone who is godly offer prayer to you at a time when you may be found. Surely in the rush of great waters they shall not reach him. You are a hiding place for me. You preserve me from trouble. You surround me with shouts of deliverance. The first benefit of forgiveness that David lists in this part of the psalm is prayer. Prayer is possible because we have been forgiven of our sins and therefore reconciled to God. Because we have been forgiven, 
we can come to the Lord in prayer. Notice that this is the basis for prayer. It is on the basis of our relationship with God through Christ. It is not because of good prayers. It is not because of performance. We can come to the throne of God in prayer because we've been forgiven, not because our prayers are so great. Your prayers are answered because of Jesus, not because of your eloquence. The other thing we need to see is that all of God's people can pray. If all of God's people are those who have been forgiven of their sins and reconciled to God, then all of God's people can come to him in prayer. There are times in church history that we can look back and the idea was that there were only certain holy people that could pray and they had to pray for you. Today, what I think that looks like is we think there's something magical about the prayer happening behind one of these. Or someone that we respect. They, they must, they have the gold phone to the Lord. The old joke about how prayer for some is a local call as opposed to long distance. I'll have to explain that joke to second service because many of them have never had local and long distance. But anyway. But again, if prayer is a benefit of forgiveness, then everyone who has been forgiven can pray to the Lord and be heard. The third thing I want us to see about prayer here is the wonderful blessing that prayer is during the hard times. Look back at the text here. Offer prayer to you at a time when you may be found. Surely in the great rush of waters, they shall not reach him. It's not the only time we should pray. But we can pray even when our life feels like rushing waters over us. This made me think of a time a couple years ago, I went whitewater rafting over in eastern Washington. And I'm a pretty good swimmer. I was a lifeguard earlier in my life, uh, in college and in seminary. And so, and I grew up on Lake Michigan, so Swimming in large bodies of water was not, you know, new to me. But when our whitewater raft flipped, it really didn't matter how good of a swimmer I was. I was overwhelmed by the strength of that river. And I knew it when I got out. <laughs> but that's what I want you to see in what he says about the rush of great waters. Because there are times in your life that no matter how strong you are, you feel like you're drowning. You feel like the current is overwhelming you. And what do we do? We pray. We have the benefit because we belong to God through prayer. So when you are overwhelmed, when you are drowning in your life, you as a forgiven child of God, can reach out to him in prayer. Let's look at the next benefit found in verse 7. The benefit of safety. Verse 7, you are a hiding place for me. You preserve me from trouble. You surround me with shouts of deliverance. Here we see language that we have seen throughout our study of the Psalms, in particular this last stretch uh, this summer here. God is a safe place. He is a hiding place. In our relationship with God, we are preserved from trouble. When we feel like we are surrounded by enemies and problems like rushing water, in fact, verse 7, you surround me with shouts of deliverance. Do you see how he changed that there? From being surrounded by water and we've seen David talk about before being surrounded by his enemies like a besieged city. But here, we're surrounded, but we're surrounded by God's shouts of deliverance. 
when we are reconciled to God through repentance and forgiveness, we can count on the protection of God. And that we are surrounded by his deliverance. Let's look at the next set of pairs here in verses 8 and 9. So we've gone from the benefits of prayer and safety. And now here, like I said before, we're going to get into the last two are contrasts. And again, this is the result of our being forgiven and reconciled to God. This is the type of life that we now lead as his people. So the contrast in verses 8 to 9 is instruction, not stubbornness. Look at verses 8 and 9 with me. I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will counsel you with my eye upon you. Be not like a horse or a mule without understanding, which might be curbed with bit and bridle, or it will not stay near you. So here's the contrast. Instruction versus stubbornness. Let's first look at instruction there. Now, it might feel like a sharp turn in the reading. All of a sudden, he's talking I, and we have to figure out who's the I there. The best understanding, I think, is that the I refers to God, that in a sense, we might put quotations there, and and David is giving us God's word from his perspective. We, We can know this with some certainty because of other psalms that talk about God teaching and leading his people. So Psalm 25, which we did a few weeks ago. Psalm 25 says, Good and upright is the Lord, therefore he instructs sinners in the way. He leads the humble in what is right and teaches the humble his way. So with that being said, let's look at verse 8 there. When we are reconciled to God through forgiveness, we begin a life of obedience to God, a life of following him. And the benefit here is that we're not alone in trying to figure out what it means to follow God. The blessing of being a forgiven person, the benefit of being one of God's reconciled people, is that we're not alone in following him. God himself teaches us, instructs us, and counsels us. When we are forgiven, we can actually follow God because it's not just up to us. He himself will lead and teach us primarily through his word. It is one of the most basic truths that I think we can overlook it sometimes, that God has actually told us what he wants especially in relation to the religions of that day. The religions of that day would study the stars. They would look at things like a sheep's liver. If you want to know about that, I can tell you more later. But you'd cut open a sheep, you'd look at the liver, and then you'd look at what other livers looked like in past years. And what happened in those years? Well, if the liver's the same, that same thing will happen. That's real. Would you rather look at a sheep's liver... Or would you rather rather actually read some words? If you're making something, if you're baking a cake and you need a recipe, do you want to look at a liver or look at the stars for the recipe or do you want to actually look at a cookbook? There's something that we overlook often and that is the grace of the clarity of Scripture. That God, in many words and many details, tells us exactly what he wants. He tells us exactly, in a very detailed way, the type of life that leads to flourishing in his world. Again, as we think of what are the benefits to me as a forgiven person, that God has spoken and his people have written that down for us today. And we have a whole book, a long book, a detailed book 
of God saying, this is what I want. This is for my glory and your good. You are not alone in just trying to guess what God wants. In saying, well, okay, I saw that star, so I guess I should take groceries to my neighbor. God teaches us. He instructs us. He counsels us through the clarity of his word. Now, what's the contrast to that? We've got a fun contrast in verse 9 here. In contrast to the blessing of instruction, we have rejection and stubbornness. Look at verse 9. Be not like a horse or a mule without understanding, which must be curved with bit and bridle, or it will not stay near you. Contrasted with the blessing of God teaching us is a warning about our stubborn lack of understanding. In contrast to the wise God who counsels and instructs his people is a warning for us not to be stubborn animals. And David uses a great picture of a horse and mule here in verse 9. A couple things we need to see. No matter how much you love your my dog is smarter than your honor student or politician bumper sticker, animals are not smarter than people. Everybody fill in your own joke. Okay, we'll move on. But the point is, the point is, to reject God's wisdom is to have subhuman intelligence. Animals go off of instinct. Yes, you can train them. Yes, some of them are wicked smart for animals. But again, What he's saying here, look at the text, verse 9. Be not like a horse or mule without understanding. To reject the goodness of God's instruction is to be like a stubborn mule. Secondly, horses and mules must be compelled to stay close. Talks about their in verse 9, which must be curved with bit and bridle or it will not stay near you. Time for another camp story. So when I worked at camp, one of my jobs was in the horse barn and I oversaw and there were about 80 horses in this horse barn. And one time, one of the younger horses, a very young horse, got stuck in between these bars that were used to tie up the different horses. And she had this long bar and you just tie up your horses and wait for the kids to use them. Well, this small horse got underneath this bar somehow and couldn't get out. Now, if I got stuck in there, it'd be really easy for me to get out. Again, everybody fill in your own joke. Uh, It'd be really easy for me to get out because I would just bend down and go under the bar. But this horse didn't and wouldn't. And so when I tried to get in there, and I put a rope on him, and I was trying to do what was right for it and get it out from there so it could eat and be where it was supposed to be, its thanks to me was a nice kick in the shins. Which you remember, even though it's a tiny horse, those things are all muscle. And that did not feel nice. It was stuck there, again, not knowing what was good for itself and not taking my lead until one of the older guys who was a big old farm boy, everything you're picturing, yes, okay? And he used some rope and in essence tripped the horse so it could come out underneath the bar and be where it was supposed to be. That is the picture for our hearts. A bunch of stubborn mules who don't know what's good for them, who in essence need to be compelled. That's the contrast, the blessing of being led and taught by the God of the universe and being a stubborn mule who doesn't know what's going on. I'll give you a hint which one you should want. (laughs) 
Again, recognize the, but these blessings are ours because we've been forgiven and reconciled to God. Calls for a soft heart, a humble heart that wants to follow what God has said. The third pair in Psalm 32, again, another contrast. And this one is more of a result contrast, but the contrast is gladness, not sorrow. Let's look at verses 10 and 11. Many are the sorrows of the wicked, but steadfast love surrounds the one who trusts in the Lord. Be glad in the Lord and rejoice, O righteous, and shout for joy, all you upright in heart. Verse 10 begins by telling us that those who have rejected God, those who have acted like stubborn mules, who have rejected him and his teaching and his forgiveness, have many sorrows. The one who has rejected God will not receive forgiveness. And so they will experience hardship because of their sin that we saw in earlier in this psalm including the heavy hand of God's judgment and discipline. And in their rejection, they do not know the blessing of prayer. They do not know the blessing of God's protection. And they do not know the joy of being taught and counseled by God. With all of that being true, it should not surprise ourselves. It should not surprise us that these people who reject God and all his blessings and all his benefits, experience many sorrows. But those who have been forgiven do not experience great sorrow, but experience great love. The contrast between the many sorrows of verse 10 in the first part find their opposite in the second part of verse 10. While those who reject God experience many sorrows, those who repent and receive forgiveness of their sins have steadfast love that surrounds them. So even when we do experience sorrow, which is real, and believers who are in right relationship with God will still experience sorrow, Even in that sorrow, we are surrounded by the unending love of God. And therefore, the result of that, verse 11, Be glad in the Lord and rejoice, O righteous, and shout for joy, all you upright in heart. Gladness, in contrast to sorrow, is both the result of the love of God and a command to live in the light of the love of God. Joy and gladness in the midst of hardship of living in a fallen world are actually possible because when we are reconciled to God through forgiveness, we experience the never-ending love of God. A psalm that dove deep into the suffering of this world Remember, my bones wasted away in verse 3. A psalm that dives deep into that emotion ends with a note of joy and celebration of the love of God. Forgiveness and reconciliation lead to a life of enduring joy and gladness. A couple thoughts as we close up today. Number one, through forgiveness, we have the blessings of prayer and God's protection. Neglecting prayer is worse than neglecting benefits like the GI Bill. If someone had that benefit available to them and they didn't use it, you'd say, you're crazy not to use that. You save so much. How much more the benefit of prayer to the God of the universe? You'd be crazy not to use it. Use your benefits. And resting in that truth that, again, we've seen across the Psalms in our current study this week. This this idea that God is our refuge and our hiding place and our fortress. 
there's a strength we can have knowing that we have the protection of God. Number two, enjoy the blessing of God's instruction and counsel. God will give you the wisdom you need. God will teach you clearly in his word what he expects of you. God will sometimes use his word to painfully correct you. Don't be a stubborn mule. Receive God's leading with humility and as an act of love. And finally, this psalm reminds us to use the words of Paul in Philippians. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say, rejoice. We can have joy and not sorrow because our sins are forgiven. It's an objective truth that is the basis for joy even in the hardest times. Our sins are paid for. They are not coming back. And again, to borrow the words of this psalm, we can have joy and be glad in the Lord because his steadfast love surrounds us. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for Psalm 32, that we would today see the benefits of forgiveness, the results of our forgiveness and reconciliation to you. That we would quick be quick to rest in your protection, that we would be quick to prayer, that we would humbly and eagerly pursue your teaching and instruction, and that through forgiveness and our reconciled relationship to you, we would have an unending source of joy and gladness, even in the hardest times, because your steadfast love surrounds us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.